Hey Space Apps community, I'm so excited to introduce you to the first ever Space Apps History Challenge called Mission to Planet Earth, a Digital History. Like other Space Apps challenges, it's all about getting people around the world engaged with NASA's incredible open data. However, what makes it different is that it asks you to create an interactive digital project using NASA's historical archives. It also asks you to think about an aspect of NASA's history that sometimes gets buried. It's history studying planet Earth. In this video, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the challenge, but then please stick around to hear from three very special NASA guests about some of their favorite moments in NASA's history. I'll be joined by Jim Green, NASA's Chief Scientist, Lawrence Friedel, the Director of the Applied Sciences Program within the Earth Science Division at NASA Headquarters, and last but not least, Brian Odom, NASA's Acting Chief Historian. To get you thinking, I'll quickly share one of my own favorite moments in NASA history that changed the trajectory of its mission to planet Earth. You may recognize the scene behind me as Earthrise, the iconic photograph taken by Apollo 8 astronauts in 1968. As their spacecraft rotated around the lunar surface, they suddenly looked out the window to see the Earth peek out or rise from behind the moon's surface. This photograph and others like it in the 1960s and 1970s had a huge impact on people around the world. It provided humanity with a completely new vantage point. And it was a turning point in NASA's history. 50 years after taking the photograph, astronaut William Anders reflected. He said, we set out to explore the moon and instead discovered the Earth. For your project, you can choose to tell any story of NASA's Earth Science Enterprise. You may choose to tell a big picture story, or you may focus on one event, one person, one technology, mission, or cultural shift. You may choose to highlight successes or focus on challenges, failures, and setbacks experienced along the way. You may also consider NASA's collaborations with other space agencies or partners, especially in your home country. Whatever direction you go, keep in mind that the technology you build, the stories you tell, and how you tell the story are all equally important. Please join me now in hearing my guests explore their own favorite moments. They'll take us on a journey that includes Explorer 1, the first satellite launched by the United States in 1958, to the role of scientists in the 1980s who discovered the depletion of the Earth's ozone layer, to the 1990s as the Earth science mission within NASA was maturing and as we were discovering more and more ways to apply our knowledge about the Earth. As you'll hear throughout the stories and something you'll want to consider as you approach this challenge is how much humanity's interest in space exploration and the moon and other planets and faraway galaxies has been intimately tied to knowledge about our own planet and our own existence. We hope that you will be inspired to take on the challenge and tell your own story about the history of Earth science. Well, I think probably as a historian, I have to look back way into the past as far as I can, right? And usually that's associated with some great first. And Explorer 1, which launched in January of 1958, was probably that for America. I mean, we're talking even before NASA's created, actually, which was, a, which was a prompt for NASA to be created. But Explorer 1 was America's first satellite in orbit. It was a follow-on to Sputnik, which the Soviets had launched, which was a transistor in space. But Explorer 1 was more of an actual scientific experiment. And what it did was it basically... James Van Allen at the University of Iowa, his team is able to create a satellite that's gonna have these detectors on it that detects actual radiation belts and trapped radiation around the earth that basically proves that, you know, why we have an atmosphere in the first place, right? Because it's, tra it's this trapped radiation that really protects us from the, the solar weather that we get in the universe, in the, in the solar system. So it's an incredibly 
early. It, it, so Explorer One is both incredibly early, but it's incredibly important. It's almost foundational to Earth science going forward. It's it's really a unique experiment. So in the middle 1980s, I was head of the National Space Science Data Center, where a lot of data coming from Earth science satellites were actually stored, managed, archived, and then redistributed to many organizations that wanted to continue that analysis. And an enormously important event happened in that middle 80s time frame. And that's when the National Science Foundation had made a major discovery they went down to Antarctica, set up a system, and tried to measure the ozone over the South Pole. And what they found is they couldn't find any ozone over the South Pole. Now, this caused quite a stir in, in, in the Earth science community since we had a satellite. It was called Nimbus 7, and it was making ozone measurements on a regular basis. So as the satellite orbits the Earth, you actually could get a global distribution of ozone over a many-day time period. All that data was in the National Space Science Data Center. So the scientists came over, acquired the data, and began to reprocess it. Now, initially, they couldn't see the ozone hole. And part of that was because they plotted it in a Mercator projection, where the equator is at the middle of the plot, and the North Pole and the South Pole are at the top and the bottom of the plots, respectively. And when you look at it, well, it looks like the Earth is full of ozone. But one of the scientists, P.K. Bartia, said, well, look, we need to change the coordinate system. We need to, to look at this data in a polar plot form and put the South Pole at the center. By doing that, the immediate difference was obvious. The ozone hole was there. When we plotted it in that um, polar coordinates over many years, we then could even see the change in the ozone as every year it began getting bigger. And of course, what was happening is ozone at 20 kilometers of, above the surface uh, is a global distribution as it's being destroyed and the wind patterns are putting it back uh, together on this globe, the, the hole actually begins in the polar regions. And that was a dynamic, an important dynamic to understand about ozone circulation. Even though it was being destroyed all over the place, the results were going to show up in the poles. Now, the next big event is why is this happening? What is causing the destruction of ozone? And the scientists went through a variety of literature searches and came up with a series of papers from planetary scientists that are studying the planet Venus, recognizing that at Venus, chlorine was destroying ozone at the planet Venus, started a line of reasoning that led eventually to our Earth scientists identifying chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, as the culprit. The first C, of course, is for chlorine. Now, this is really uh, an important connection. We are so lucky to have Venus, Earth, and Mars in our solar system, where we can do a variety of comparisons between our three planets and the climate evolution of those planets. They are at different stages of their evolution based on their mass, but also the distance they are from the sun and the amount of heat they receive. So these are important lessons for all of us to understand and apply to our future. One of my favorite moments is space shuttle mission STS-59. Uh, and so this space shuttle mission flew in April 1994, but it was really the preparations uh, for the years before it flew, as well as the data and the analysis that, uh, that followed. And so STS-59 was a space shuttle mission dedicated to Earth science activities. 
uh, had a couple main instruments on board. One was the what they call sur C, which is the Spaceborne Imaging Radar C, and XR, which is the X-band Synthetic Aperture Radar. Uh, and together, these collected data about hydrology, global carbon cycle, geology, natural hazards, ecology, like a forests, and, 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 and much more as well as there was an instrument called MAPS, M-A-P-S, which is the measurement of air pollution from satellites. And so why was this important? Uh, so at NASA, the mission, the NASA mission to planet Earth was an activity, uh, an enterprise that began in the early 1990s. Uh, and it was focused on advancing Earth science research and getting data out to the scientific community. And they were busy developing Earth science satellites as part of the Earth observing system and related efforts. But those satellites that they were going to be launching at the end of the 1990s and into the early 2000s, uh, things that were known at the time as AM1 and PM1, but we now know today as Terra and Aqua and Aura and, and others. And so therefore this mission, this STS-59 mission and all the data collected gave really tangible boost to the mission to planet Earth during that long development time towards these, towards these satellites like Terra and Aqua. And so why is that my favorite? Well, personally, I was working at the Mission Control Center at Johnson Space Center at the time. I was the lead attitude and pointing officer for STS-59, uh, and I was working directly with the research team the astronauts, the flight control team to prepare for and conduct this space shuttle mission. Uh, and, and this mission sparked my interest in Earth science. As I learned about what the mission was doing and the data that it was gonna be collecting about the Earth, it sparked my interest in the applications of that data. Those creative uses to support policy items public management of resources, support to private sector and nonprofits even. Um, for example, I remember a time when the researchers at the Jet Propulsion Lab were talking about using CIRSI and XR to measure the snowpack in the Sierras. And I immediately thought about, like, that's water runoff. Like, that's better reservoir management in California. And so because of this mission, I went to graduate school to get a degree in public policy to complement my aerospace engineering degree. Uh, and I've been working on remote sensing applications ever since. It was first at EPA and then at NASA uh, in the Applied Scientist Program. Uh, and I'm fortunate today to be the director of that program. And so this mission really helped set a course for me in sort of working on these ways that Earth science can serve society. Would say be really, really creative and expansive in what you think Earth science history might be. Uh, I talked about a space shuttle mission, and so that's certainly some of you know some items. These different missions, these different satellites, and these different instruments. But I would say there's also could be you know notable people, notable researchers, or others that, or it could be seminal papers that were written. Um, it could also be different uh, awards that have been given out. Um, four things were notable times. And so I would say to be really, really creative and expansive in what you think um, you know, history, uh, history could involve. The advice I give someone who's uh, kind of undertaking this history journey to really learn something and build upon the, you know, to really think about the past, you know, my advice is always to, to take something that you're inspired by, a topic that inspires you personally, because whether it's writing a dissertation or, or whatever road you're going down in history or, or, or participating in this challenge, you want something that, that speaks to you because you want to do it, you want to have a job well done, right? And so when it means something to us and we kind of we can internalize that, it's you know, it, it will pay off in multiple ways. And across NASA, obviously, there's no shortage of those things, right? Whether it's the inspirational people, Sally Ride you know, uh, Guy Blueford or any of these people, the, the astronauts or, or the programs themselves, if there's some, you know, the, the uncovering black holes across the universe or, or something like that, just find something that speaks to you and just follow your passions.
part of it is I, under, I think we need to understand the long history, uh, both at NASA and in many space agencies that we've, that we've had in terms of using the vantage point of space in terms of helping us understand the Earth. Uh, and the collection of data that we have from, from space really helps us put, get some unique insights into Earth system processes. Uh, and, and that has scientific value. It helps us build new knowledge and new insights about the Earth, but it also provides us ways to apply that information uh, and all. And so I think understanding that longer history can help provide some of the context today uh, for what we're doing today. Secondly, I also recognize that the applications that we're doing today in terms of uses of this derived from technology investments and research investments and instrument investments that happened 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and we wouldn't have these beneficial uses today had it not been for these decades of decades of investments in the research and the technology. It's important because NASA does so many monumental things, right? Everything that we do, whether it's, you know, the Apollo program going to the moon, uh, you know, kind of capturing the history that happened there and the work we do today, continuing to, to, to communicate that history to the public. And it basically informs our understanding of why we do what we do, why we go and we explore you know, why we're going to go back to the moon with the Artemis program, why we send a rover to, to Mars, right? A perseverance that'll land in February of next year. My, so my job is kind of a dual job. It's really to, to capture the history as it's being made and to communicate that history to the public that, that informs how they understand the role we play, you know, uh, in that process. I, I, I think it's critical, and, but it also, from an internal perspective, uh, the history function is important because it it enables the workforce who who are working on these great programs to hear about the lessons that have preceded them. The the work that we're doing for like the James Webb Telescope, there's similar work that's underway for the Hubble Space Telescope, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, big observatories like that that can really that knowing that history can really instruct the people that are, that are working on these programs today to, to avoid the mistakes of the past and to, you know, to draw on the successes of the past. And I think, you know, anytime you're dealing with both the science mission and the human exploration mission, those lessons apply. You think about the space shuttle program and all the great lessons we learned with that 30 years of, you know, traveling to and from Earth into low Earth orbit, uh, the, the critical lessons we learned with those, those, you know, the propulsion systems, even from a space science system, when you have, you know, Space Lab, uh, International Space Station that's celebrating its 20 year anniversary this year. You know, human beings have been in our, you know, above our heads in orbit for, for you know, continually for that period. And so I think capturing that history is important and, and being able to, to use that to make the next great step. It's just critical.